Welcome to Life at the Academy, a midshipman-produced podcast that examines how the culture, traditions, and daily life at Annapolis have evolved over time. I'm Midshipman Nels Warrenamy. Our episode today is recorded in Larson Hall. That's the building on the Naval Academy grounds that houses the superintendent's office. This was because we received an invitation from our superintendent, Vice Admiral Buck, to interview him in his office. It was an honor for us midshipmen to get this opportunity, and we really enjoyed spending the afternoon with Vice Admiral Buck. We were interested in asking him about his time as a midshipman, and of course his experiences in the fleet, and now the challenges and the many positives about serving as superintendent of the Naval Academy. Without any further delay, I will introduce him to you. Vice Admiral Sean Buck is a native of Indianapolis, Indiana. He is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and received his commission in 1983. He was designated a Naval Flight Officer in 1985. Then he earned a Master's of Arts in International Security Policy from George Washington University and has completed studies at the College of Naval Command and Staff, U.S. Naval War College, and the Armed Forces Staff College, as well as a fellowship with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and executive certificate programs at both the Harvard Kennedy School and Harvard Graduate School of Education. As a flag officer, Vice Admiral Buck has served as Commander, Patrol, and Reconnaissance Force with the U.S. 5th and 7th Fleets, Fleet Air Forward, Patrol and Reconnaissance Group, Chief of Staff, Strategy, Plans, and Policy, J-5, the Joint Staff, Director, 21st Century Sailor Office, where his portfolio included the Navy's programs on sexual assault prevention and response, suicide prevention, alcohol abuse, and other destructive behaviors, and most recently, he served as Commander, U.S. Naval Forces Southern Command, U.S. Fourth Fleet. Flying the P-3C Orion, Vice Admiral Buck served in several early at-sea operational tours and currently serves as the 63rd Superintendent of the U.S. Naval Academy. This interview was enjoyable for us midshipmen, but it was also inspiring because we found that Vice Admiral Buck's experiences as a midshipman were not all that different from our own, and it was inspiring to be in the Vice Admiral's historic office where the history and heritage of the Naval Academy is clearly on display. Here was our conversation with Vice Admiral Buck. Vice Admiral Buck, sir, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks for having me. So, sir, we'd like to begin by asking how the Naval Academy as an institution developed you as an individual. Well, it took a, it took a young kid from Indianapolis, Indiana, who maybe thought he was a big fish in a little pond in Indianapolis and in high school, and it really opened my eyes up to a lot of different things about the world. One, I found myself immersed amongst at least 1,200 of my classmates who were as good or way better than I was academically, athletically, confidence in life. Um, and it really humbled me. It kind of put me in my place initially, going, I'm no longer the big fish. Um, I'm a little fish in a little pond, and I need to, to really grow my competitive spirit because we're a competitive company. The Naval Academy is a competitive organization. The United States military is a competitive company. So it uh, immediately caused me to up my game in every aspect of my life. Sir, a unique aspect about the academy is that each midshipman has a unique small impact on changing the academy, academy's culture. Some midshipmen, such as Senator John McCain, has pushed it back against the culture, and some have embraced it. Where would you say you have fallen on this spectrum? Well, they say when you guys, when you guys graduate in commission and you're out with your classmates and your friends and you're out with other alumni from the academy, maybe in classes somewhat near, near your class, you're going to realize that all of us alumni fall into one of two categories. It's about a 50-50 split. Go up to a Naval Academy graduate and said, if you had an opportunity to do it over again, would you? 
and half of us alumni say, heck no, no way, I didn't have a good experience there, I wouldn't do that again. And half of us say, absolutely, we'd love to do it again. It was a wonderful experience. I find myself on the latter. I had a wonderful journey at the academy. And uh, if I could rewind the clock, I would do it again. And what's so unique about having been selected to be, come back to be the superintendent is I'm getting a little chance to somewhat do that again, to be immersed in the the culture of the Naval Academy and enjoy it. I don't necessarily run the life of a midshipman again, but but I'm here with all the goodness that, that the yard has to offer us. Sir, what did you learn from being a member of the tennis team? My response would be kind of like what I, I responded to your first question. Uh, I thought I was a pretty good tennis player. I thought I was pretty competitive until I came and realized who my teammates were and how well they played the game and where I fit in that pecking order, which was pretty low. I was not as accomplished of a tennis player as, as many others that got recruited to play here. But it also continued to teach me something that I learned in high school, the value of being on a team. I had a very successful high school tennis team in which as a team, we excelled and won at the highest levels. But as an individual, um, I didn't always prevail. Uh, I didn't always win my point. But it was very rewarding to win as a team. Well, that, that translated exactly into Navy sports. The Navy men's tennis team, we were representing ourselves as a team, not as individual midshipmen. And I continued to find it very rewarding to win and be accomplished as a team. And then that translated into a wonderful mentality for service in the fleet. We're a team effort. The military service is a team effort. There's no letter I in the word team. So being part of, a, of an athletic team contributed to, to that, to, to, to me really, really respecting and and wanting and gravitating toward the team concept and it also told me that I either had teammates rally around me when I would not prevail in a particular match or that I could help rally around them when they needed a little pick-me-up if they weren't doing so well. Sir, as a follow-up question to that, can you speak to your experiences of balancing being an athlete being a midshipman and focusing on academics and while at the same time focusing on developing yourself as a military officer, we find as midshipmen that perhaps time is the biggest thing we lack and we would love to hear your experiences in dealing with some of the things that we are facing today as midshipmen during your time at the academy. So that's one of those enduring things uh, that, that transfer to a midshipman year after year after year, even for me in the decade of, of the 80s and you all here uh, in the decade of the 2020s is time management. I tell public audiences that two of the most important skills that all of us midshipmen graduate from here with is really, really solid time management skills and critical thinking skills. And so when we're all required to excel academically we're all required to play a sport. You either play a Division One sport or a club sport or an intramural sport. But we, we take that part of our day and we do athletics um, as well as all the time spent in professional development. All of that's contributing toward time management skill sets. And then we all have to have the individual responsibility to manage our time. And it's hard for all of us to knowingly let something fall off the plate that either we want to do or we know we have to do, but there's higher priority things. And it teaches us how to overcome that sinking feeling when we don't get everything done in a day that either we wanted to get done or we thought uh, we would get done. And by, at the end of the day, when you put your head on the pillow, you realize that even though you didn't accomplish your whole to-do list, you accomplished the most important things. And, and that skill set translates very, very well out into service in the fleet. Sir, so during one of the first addresses that you gave to the brigade, I remember you mentioned what you learned from the 
generation of officer leadership on the yard when you were a midshipman, and that was the generation that had, had experienced Vietnam. Could you tell us what you learned from those men? Oh my gosh, yeah, I continue to be positively influenced by what I learned from those men. In particular, I'd like to mention a few of their names. They were the men who not only served our country in Vietnam, but they unfortunately became prisoners of war uh, in that war. My first of two superintendents was Vice Admiral Bill Lawrence, uh, captive uh, by the North Vietnamese for over eight years. Uh, my battalion officer was Commander Bob Galanti, uh, captive uh, in prison for seven plus years. And he was the one that endured just absolutely brutal, brutal torture and blinked with his eyes um, with Morse code torture on a propaganda film. And that's where the world came to know that our prisoners were not being treated very well. One of the other battalion officers was Captain Dick Stratton. Uh, I think he was the first battalion officer. I was in the fourth battalion. But what I learned from those men was unbelievable sacrifice, the true sacrifice of what service to our country meant. The, sh the, the, the absolute, really unfathomable and immeasurable courage that those men showed to make it through captivity, the faith that they had in their God, the faith that they had in their country, and the faith that they had in themselves to persevere and make it through. Once you began to learn these men's histories, you really stopped complaining and thinking that you had any, any problems at the U.S. Naval Academy. So did they talk about their experiences or was it a leadership by example situation? Both. They did give us really, really important uh, lessons on leadership and resilience and perseverance. So they would talk about it. I believe that was part of their healing process was to continue to talk about it. And it made them feel good that they could pass on those lessons to us. But they also led by, by very fine example. Sir, besides officers, faculty members also make their contributions to the culture of, at the academy. Was there a specific class or professor who had a large impact on your development while you were here? Um, I don't remember all of my professors' names very clearly, but I would suggest a, a couple of the classes had a big impact on me. Um, mainly my physics class in my youngster year. Um, I think truly my performance in physics and the attention that my professor gave to me in that class actually drove me to my major and drove me to my career field in the Navy of flying the P-3 Orion aircraft, which is an anti-submarine warfare aircraft. And ASW, you fall back a lot on your knowledge of physics, uh, the physics of light, of sound, of oh, different environments. And that was kind of, um, professionally, that was life-changing on, on how I got so immersed into physics. And that's kind of early on. And then that really tailored what I chose to study for the rest of my time at the academy. And then when I moved out into the fleet, I continued to be fascinated with how things work um, and then understanding the application it had to warfighting and looking and hunting for submarines. So you said the attention that your professor gave to you. Could you tell us more about that? I was really, we we're all lucky. Uh, you all right now as midshipmen and, and when I was a midshipman, we were very, very lucky to have had a college experience in which we had such small professor to student ratios and small classrooms where we could get a lot of individual attention from our professors. Uh, you don't find that hardly anywhere else in this country. And uh, I remember that any time that I needed access to any of my professors, they were always there for me. Um, and that helped me learn. I, I, was, uh, I was a student who had to study really hard at the Naval Academy. I did not find the academic curriculum easy. Um, so I was one of those that would always be seeking out extra instruction um, and help in the professors. I remember not necessarily all of their names, 
but I remember they always gave us access. And I still see that to this day. Sir, on the topic of academics, the Academy has the unique um, objective of balancing both being a prestigious college and also developing midshipmen to be future Naval, of, Naval and Marine Corps officers. How do you as a superintendent see the balance of academics and professional development? How do you try to balance that as, your, as uh, the superintendent of the Naval Academy? So just as a footnote, we've noticed with some professors that we've spoken to how that balance has shifted over the years. Some say that in the 1980s, for example, the military was emphasized more than the academics and it shifted more towards the academics. I see it differently. Um, and, and my take on this um, is, is, is deep into my core. We midshipmen, we receive a world-class education here. Bar, bar none, it is a world-class education. Um, and the fact of the different opportunities of what to major in is, is pretty exciting on where you can put your energies to, to learn. Every single adult on the yard is truly responsible for y'all's professional development as, as leaders of character. Even your barber, anybody on the yard can, can lead by example and, and help develop you all uh, during your four-year journey here. With that said, the most important thing that the U.S. Naval Academy does is to develop your character. You need to have a rock solid foundation in integrity, honor, character, ethics, and then you build upon that, that world-class education, and then you build upon that the professional development outside of, of leadership. Um, you get stressed out over the years with too much on your plate to, to, to manage your time. And you'll take all that out into the fleet, and if it's all built upon a rock-solid foundation of character, you'll never fail in the fleet. You'll never truly fail. You can always fall back on your honor and your integrity, and you'll never compromise that. I think the center of gravity of that is over in Loose Hall. In Loose Hall, we teach you two things. That's the, the leadership, the character, and ethical development as well as seamanship and navigation, a core skill set that all of us naval officers need to have. So you go over to Loose Hall, and I think the focus there is solid. It's even better than it was when I was a midshipman. You now are taking those types of courses through your whole four-year journey here. That was not the case in the early 80s. Um, what we've done is we've just filled up more of your time with academic pursuits, too. But I think the balance is, is just right right now. And uh, I'm very satisfied with the balance in your development over four years. Sir, you anticipated our next question, but uh, could you tell us about what you learned from the superintendents that you served under as a midshipman? So I had two. Uh, my first two years was uh, Vice Admiral Bill Lawrence, as we've already talked about him. And my second uh, superintendent was Vice Admiral Ed Waller, very unique to the Buck family. Vice Admiral Ed Waller, too, was an aviator. He was my father's co-pilot in the fleet and a very close friend of the Buck family. And I didn't quite appreciate that and understand that when I first came. He and my father kind of kept that from me. Um, but what I learned from those men was how dignified they led and how much they truly cared about the mission of the Naval Academy, which is to develop midshipmen morally, mentally, and physically. Their focus on that mission statement still continues today, and I found myself emulating them Everyone here is so singularly focused on our mission statement of developing the brigade of midshipmen, morally, mentally, and physically. So I learned from them how to focus on the job at hand. Do the job that the Navy has asked you to do, and when we're all here at the Academy, it's the professional development of the next generation of leaders. 
And they both, both my superintendents did it very well. Sir, as a midshipman, what was your perception on the role of, of the superintendent at the academy? And since becoming the superintendent, has your perception changed? Yes, it has. My, so I, I did not know my two superintendents very well. And as I've asked myself to draw back on any memories I have of my superintendents, they are a bit foggy. And I realize that I didn't, I don't have memories of routinely seeing them. And I decided not to do that. I didn't want to be like that. I would prefer that you all, years and years from now, have memories of your association with Vice Admiral Sean Buck, your superintendent. And I'd like you to be able to remember that I had a positive impact on your journey at the Naval Academy. And to do that, I go, I go out of my way to make sure that I'm as present as I possibly can be in front of you all when you're doing your different activities. Um, you'll find out as you two uh, matriculate to your first class year, you're going to be invited to my home during the academic year. And we're going to break bread together and get to know each other off duty a little bit. Um, I just want to have more engagement with the brigade than I remember I had with my superintendents. Sir, could you tell us a little bit about your daily responsibilities as superintendent? My responsibilities are, they go two different directions and you'll hear these terms out in the fleet uh, when, when, when you get there next year. Primarily, I'm supposed to represent the Naval Academy up and out. And what I mean by that is I represent the Naval Academy and its, its needs, its requirements to my chain of command above me, to the senior levels of leadership in the Navy, to members of Congress who provide all of the funding so that we can have a Naval Academy um, and run it, and to the American people, the taxpayers whose tax dollars allow us to have a Naval Academy. That's kind of up the chain of command and out broadly to the country and actually to the world. And I represent Annapolis and the United States Naval Academy and all that we do and who and all of the people here. I also have a role to go down and in. And down means go down the chain of command through all of the people that are subordinate to me in rank and position. Um, and also serve as their commanding officer. I'm the commanding officer of the United States Naval Academy complex. And then down and in means in and engage with the people, engage with the brigade of midshipmen, the student body, engage with the enlisted sailors that are stationed here to help, um, help you all over at waterfront readiness, to engage with the commissioned officers that are here to teach you and to lead you to engage with all the civilian workforce who feeds you and takes care of you. Um, I would say that those duties are split about 75-25. Um, 75% 75 of my role as superintendent is up and out. I'm essentially the president of a university. I'm called a superintendent. It's a military school, but I do many of the roles that a president of a university would do. And the commandant of midshipmen is in charge. He's, he or she would be the dean of students. The commandant is responsible for most of the down and in. Uh, but, I, I, but I have a responsibility as a commanding officer to do both. And so when you came here as superintendent in July of 2019, what objectives and goals did you have for the brigade? My most strategic goal in my mind was to be sure during the time I was superintendent to make sure that I leave it better than I found it. You'll want to do that in every one of your commands. You'll want to adopt the team and see how you can continue to improve it and, and help the people in it. Um, specifically what I brought, I had come from a position of command. I had been an operational commander as the commander of the United States Fourth Fleet. And what I brought is I brought a very current 
fleet set of requirements. What does the fleet need? Um, and we quite often ask the fleet, what do you all need midshipmen to be skilled at? What should we be doing here with midshipmen at the Naval Academy with regards to their mental, moral, and physical mission? And what we needed out in the fleet was we needed ec uh, experts in data science, data analytics, big data. We're all, as human beings right now, we're overcome and sometimes super saturated with information and data more than we've ever been. There's so many sources of information. And I came to realize that there's an actual science to help distill all that and, and, and immerse yourself in, in big data and find actionable knowledge and actionable intelligence um, and to be able to make better decisions as a decision maker. So I wanted to stand up a data science major here, and we have. And the current plebe class, the class of 2025, has just had an opportunity to choose data science as a major. And I think the fleet will be well served by that in years to come as we begin to graduate those folks. Same thing happened with my predecessor as we stood up a cyber operations major. The fleet had a, a huge need for that. And my predecessor got after that with the team. And now we're producing cyber warriors and midshipmen. Every single midshipman has a little bit of a touch with cyber. So that's, that's one of the biggest things that I brought with me that I wanted to change on my watch as superintendent was giving you all the skill sets that would have direct application to war fighting in your, as, in your service to the fleet. Sir, what would you say has been the greatest challenges you face as the superintendent? Well, that big, uh, that big elephant in the room is, uh, is that five letter acronym called COVID. Um, none of us saw that coming. Um, if you'll remember my timeline, I came in uh, July of 19, as you've mentioned earlier, and about the first seven months of my journey here was phenomenal. The, uh, the academy was clicking on all cylinders. It's a very well-oiled machine. The brigade was having great success across our mission statement, uh, across all three pillars of our mission statement. Um, we were having fun. We were succeeding. We were, we were winning. You all were really, really doing well as midshipmen. And then something called coronavirus hit us. An adversary that we all had never confronted before, and that adversary was a virus, was a, a medical uh, or a physiological thing to us. And uh, there was no playbook. Uh, and we all wrote that playbook together, and we all persevered. That has definitely been the biggest challenge because we were forced to reimagine every single process at the U.S. Naval Academy. And we started over, and uh, we successfully did that. So the large overarching question for our project is how has the culture at the Naval Academy changed and stayed the same over time? Do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic will have any long-term effects on the culture here? Well, you asked the question, will it have any long-term effects? No. Although we did hit some inflection points. So if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of really anchor down there for a while since that seems to be the cornerstone of your project. Yes, sir. When I first got here, I spent uh, about the first 60 days observing, listening, learning, talking to people. And I witnessed some subcultures here, some cult subcultures, some positive subcultures. There was definitely a culture of accountability here. There was a culture of learning. There was a culture of fitness. There was a culture of character, a culture of leadership, and a culture of adventure is what I saw. And I, I find all those very positive subcultures there also was the typical subculture of cynicism that was here. Even when I was a midshipman, I believe it's always present in the brigade to some degree. Cynicism is not necessarily healthy for a team. It's one thing to complain. People that complain will bring forward something they're not happy with 
but a complainer usually comes forward with a solution. And you're generally complaining and presenting solutions to make the team or the organization better. Cynicism's not. Cynicism is you're complaining, you're not bringing any solutions at all, and you're actually working to the detriment of the team. And it's not a really good attribute to have in an organization. But the brigade has always had a, a level of cynicism. Probably fairly healthy to be able to get some things off your off your chest. That because not every day is a holiday here at the at the Naval Academy. During COVID, um, I believe we lost our way in military professionalism, military bearing. I think we lost our way in that subculture of accountability. And I think we lost our way in uh, esprit de corps. So what do I mean by those? Military bearing is pretty straightforward. Military professionalism. We got lazy. We were away from the academy for a little while. We were on our own. We, we kind of took a, took, got lackadaisical on how we present ourselves in a uniform, our haircuts, our manners, our military etiquette. That's military professionalism. Accountability, uh, where that really manifested itself was we had a, a class um, compromise their integrity um, in an academic environment. And once again, I believe that it was our lack of being together and, and, and growing from an environment of peer pressure, an, a, an environment where when we're all together, midshipmen, staff, faculty, coaches, and we hold each other accountable, we set better examples for one another. When we're all left to our own devices and we're out alone and we don't have all that peer pressure or that oversight, I think we slipped in accountability. And then what I mean by esprit de corps is not just school spirit. It's more of the remembering the pride that you had when you got accepted to the Naval Academy and how good you felt about coming to a prestigious school to be invited to become a member of a team of something much bigger than yourself, knowing that you're going to serve your country, knowing that all of your neighbors and your friends and your family were so proud of what you were doing and it made you feel proud and good. We lost that when we were dispersed during COVID and not with one another, either in office space in Bancroft Hall, eating chow together, recreating, competing together, going to school together. We lost that. Those cultures need to be regained. And I'm very proud of you all and the Brigade of Midshipmen, and I'm proud of the Commandant of Midshipmen to bring back those strong cultures. One inflection point that might persist in a way is the country, the world hit an inflection point on how we go to work and the whole idea of telework and distance learning and distance working. But what we found out at the Naval Academy is you don't develop leaders online. I can give you your degree. We can do the mental mission online as superintendent. I don't believe that's an optimal way to learn myself. And about 25% of the brigade of midshipmen presented themselves as not doing very well learning online. They struggled. This guy right here, I, I would have struggled. I'm not an online learner uh, very well. But the whole leadership laboratory that the Naval Academy presents to you all, the hands-on experiential leadership, you got to be present to do that. And that's a culture that has to be regained too. So that's why I was so determined and, and so forceful to bring you all back as fast as possible. We were not going to close down with COVID. So I don't think much will change moving forward. We cherish our naval traditions, our naval heritage, our naval history. 
there are certain things here that we do as midshipmen that bind us alumni together for the rest of our lives. Climbing Herndon, we all do it. Every alumni has done it, and it's something that we'll talk about to the day we die. The ring dance, second class years, a big deal. All of those big milestone events during your commissioning week, those are things that bind Naval Academy alumni together for life. And we can't, we can't lose those, we can't lose that part of our culture. Sir, in looking past the coronavirus pandemic and its impact on the Academy, how would you assess the brigade's progress right now in regaining those values you speak of, such as naval tradition, professionalism, and accountability? Do you think the Academy right now is looking forward to a, towards a good trajectory in regaining these aspects of the Academy, Academy's culture? Absolutely. We have, we have rebounded and we're back. I believe we started the whole journey of coming back and rebounding in May of 21, a year ago at this time. We had as close to normal of a commissioning week as we could for the class of 21. You all took off last summer and had as close of a regular summer of summer training and internships and leave and time off as, as, as we had remembered in a normal year. When you all reformed in August of 21, we moved into what you're all just concluding um, at this time, a fully normal year when we took our masks off. I think that was one of the last vestiges of COVID. Um, and you all are gonna have an even better summer with summer training, summer opportunities. And I believe those, those cultures that I talked about, esprit de corps, accountability, and military bearing, we're all, we're back. We've recaptured it all. So there's a broader national concern among some people that there's an erosion of academic freedom today. And you spoke before that you're the president of a college in a way. How do you assess academic freedom at the Naval Academy? Some people looking in might say the professors here, they're so bound up or so close to the U.S. military and the U.S. government that they don't have academic freedom. But we found in our project that's not the case at all. How do you how do you assess academic freedom here at the Naval Academy, sir? That's been a, a, a very interesting journey for me. So I'm an unusual uh, college president. I'm a commanding officer. This is a military institution. The buck stops here, and in this case, the buck stops with buck. In a military organization, there's an ultimate decision maker. It's the commanding officer. That's me. In a normal civilian academic institution, there's a very important concept called shared governance. Um, shared governance would be where the, each member of the faculty, through their, their faculty chairman, their faculty senate, are actually part of the decision-making bodies to make decisions on the academic side of the house, our mental mission at the academy. There is not shared governance at the United States Naval Academy. The commanding officer, um, informed by all of those folks, the, the provost, all of the academic department chairs, the, the faculty senate, they all uh, inform me, but the decision lies with a single person for the academy, and, and, and that's me. That's not necessarily liked um, by, by some members of our faculty. Academic freedom, specifically what you asked for, I believe that there is very robust academic freedom here. When I am asked by either citizens of the United States or specifically alumni about the controversial topics that can be taught, critical race theory, um, things like that in which there's definitely a divide and a belief some people want things like that taught, some people do not. How I answer those audiences, and that goes into academic freedom of what can be taught, what can't be, what's stifled, what's not, is we don't teach doctrine or ideology here. Um, we, we teach concepts. We, do, we don't ever want to be in the business of telling midshipmen what to think, we want to teach midshipmen how to think. 
And if we're naive enough to think that sensitive or, or controversial topics, let's talk about race. If I will tell audiences that if we don't think that the legal, moral, or ethical aspects of racial issues are not talked about in a classroom, then we're naive. Because you all need to be exposed to things like that because your sailors and your Marines are going to expect you to be conversant about that and have an opinion. But once again, we, will not we do not teach critical race theory here. Um, in my professional opinion, it's divisive, it's not unifying, but that's not to say that it won't be talked about. What is it? Why is it controversial? Why do some people like it? Why do some people not? All of that, I believe, is an academically free discussion, and it allows you all to walk away from here as critical thinkers, and you all can determine what you believe, we're going to teach you how to derive that and how to get there. Sir, as we wrap up today's discussion, we would like to end with one last question. What aspect of brigade culture would you like to see preserved into the future? Our, our, our Navy heritage, doing the things that have been tried or true in the United States Navy for hundreds of years. Um, I, I, the wearing our uniforms, having the ceremonies and celebrating the anniversaries of important Navy battles or Navy milestones should never ever be forgotten. And, and it's, it's the culture of Navy heritage that needs to be preserved. Um, I don't ever want our Navy museum to leave our campus. If you all have been to my home, it serves as kind of a small second Navy museum. There's a lot of neat artifacts and artwork that capture famous Navy history. We should all be looking at that, talking about that, appreciating it and knowing it, and then be able to pass it on to a younger generation and a younger generation year after year. I don't think that should ever go away. Well, this has been a real honor for our team, Admiral Buck, and we can't thank you enough for your time and and for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it was an honor to spend the time with you. Thank you. This has been our interview with the 63rd Superintendent of the U.S. Naval Academy, Vice Admiral Sean Buck, about his experiences as a midshipman in the fleet and now as superintendent of the academy. We thank Vice Admiral Buck for his invitation to interview him in his office, and we thank him very much for being so generous with his time and answering all of our questions. This has been the Midshipman Produced Podcast, Life at the Academy, recording from the Naval Academy's Samson Hall in Annapolis, Maryland. On behalf of the USNA History Department and our Midshipman hosts and producers, thank you for listening. We look forward to seeing you next time.